So what I'd like to do is to start this session talking about satellite-derived bathymetry. And effectively, satellite-derived bathymetry is a very use way, a useful way of getting data into um, our systems for doing habitat mapping. And here I'm just showing a very complex diagram. Don't worry about how complex it is, but really just saying that we have got all kinds of inputs that we may want to do habitat mapping. And as you can see, we have a certain amount of physical oceanography, the wave data, for instance, and sort of wave exposure. Uh, we have the marine field data that, that we were talking about on Friday in the session number four. Uh, we, we take that data, we look at the, and we try and make some kind of benthic composition, either by calibration and validation and making it some kind of mod model um, and so, sort of uh, so where we can hopefully derive some kind of benthic composition. But adding to that, we can start adding a certain amount of satellite or airborne products. Uh, satellites such as the Sentinel-2, the Hyperion, airborne products such as LiDAR or even drone uh, information. And that will create various models of either the subsur subsurface or seafloor reflectance or possibly just the water depth. And effectively, this is what we're going to cover today is how we can get water depth out of satellite imagery. Um, Obviously, once we've got that, you can start doing all kinds of the derivatives that comes from water depth, such as slope, to put into our model to help us do our habitat mapping. And we covered a few of these methods of object-based image analysis or the benthic terrain modeler, maybe to get a certain amount of geomorphic zonation. And again, once you've got that, possibly with maybe some more seafloor, you can start making this empirical model. So it's, you know, it is quite a complex thing. Um, of putting all this data together. And really what, what I want to do is to show you today um, a little bit about how the satellite derived bathymetry can be part of that process. So satellite derived bathymetry, you know, sort of we have many satellites collecting data routinely. They go around the earth quite regularly and collect that data. They can see into, the, the satellites can see through uh, maybe up to about 25 meters uh, water depth maybe 20 meters, depending on how clear the water is. Around the UK, we're not gonna get that. Um, around the waters of the Caribbean, yes, you're much more likely to be able to get that. You've got much clearer and uh, less polluted and less turbid water. There are areas, of course, you have got turbid water, but that's that thing. And effectively, you've got some multispectral, which effectively means that you've got maybe up to 10 or 12 um, different wavelengths of light uh, being, being looked at from the satellite, or we have called what hyperspectral, where we have maybe a couple of hundred wavelengths being looked at. So satellite derived bathymetry has various advantages and disadvantages. One really good advantage is it's got really large coverage, regional coverage. You know, you get huge areas, 100 kilometers by 100 kilometers, easily in, in one frame. And you're going, wow, that's very good. And the data is quite often accessible and free, or we do like free. Um, so that's that's really good. And so the other thing is these satellites go over regularly. And of course, that gives you the temporal coverage. And you can then see if you can get any change from one time to another to, to work out, you know, sort of if uh, various sediment bodies are moving or how things are changing over time. And, you know, we can do this satellite derived bathymetry now relatively quickly on your desktop. On your, on your computer there, and you go, hey, this, 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 this is really good. One of the disadvantages that some people then say is, is, is that, that it's relatively low resolution. You know, maybe you can only get 10 meter pixels. That's 10 meters by 10 meters. And you're going, well, okay, that's, that's not as high as it might be in a uh, multi-beam uh, bathymetry echo sound system. But you know, do we actually require that high resolution? Is 10 meters by 10 meters fine? Occasionally, it might be even 60 meters by 60 meters, but is that going to be, a, be, be actually what is actually required for the purpose of how you're going to actually do something or other? It's free or, you know, sort of to actually produce um, the, the satellite bathymetry. The data is free, but it's going to take a little while, and so a little bit of resource to actually process the data. But that's your time. And I don't know how your, your time is valuable um, and that therefore ought to be costed, but it actually doesn't take us very long. And I'm going to show you some of that. And really, I'm going to show you how quickly actually we can produce that. And we've got a choice of satellites. We do require deep water, uh, clear water, sorry, clear water. 
And if there's large amounts of cloud cover, yes, we can't, uh, satellites can't see through clouds particularly well. And the accuracy, well, it's not going to be the International Hydrographic Office standard. Uh, you're not going to be, used, be able to use this for um, particularly high level of navigation. Uh, you, should, you should be very aware that it's a not for navigation use. It will not come up to a standard that is acceptable. It'll get close, but not, not generally acceptable uh, for these, these types of water, because we're talking of waters less than 20 meters or so. And as I said, we talked about no resolution. So looking at the data, how do we get access to it? Well, I've included one of the websites um, where you can get access to this data. Uh, the Glovis.usgs um, site um, is a, a reasonable site, uh, sort of, uh, and sort of, uh, I'm going to sh show you a quick example of how, how to, to get that. Um, you do need a login for it to get an ID on there, but that's easily obtained, and then you can just um, download data to your heart's content. There's lots of different data sets on there. Um, so there's Landsat 7 and 8. There's the Earth Observation Satellite, um, which gives this uh, ALI and the Hyperion. The Hyperion is one that I would suggest is maybe quite useful or maybe quite useful. Unfortunately, it did finish in January 2017. So it's not particularly up to date if you're trying to do things that are really need that uh, temporal um, accuracy or time period that is today. Um, Landsat 8 is still going, uh, launched in 2013. And the other one that I think Quite a lot of you may have come across is Sentinel-2 data. So on the right, I've just got a, a, a small diagram here of the different satellites and the wavelengths, i.e. the colors um, that are coming through. And just to give an example, sort of, um, they do have different numbers and their numbering systems. And sort of, um, so be careful about which colors and what numbers you're using. If you're using Landon 7, 1, 2, and 3 are different from Landon 8, 1, 2, 3. Um, and they're very different from the Hyperion. Hyperion is, is a hyperspectral and has 220 bands, I think. And it is a, an approximate color of what's going on. And the red and the green go through water quite nicely. Red gets absorbed by water quite quickly, so therefore maybe not quite so useful. But um, things. So give an example of, of the Glovis, it's sort of, um, if you're actually going to download, sort of then start downloading data and actually get some data for your area, wherever you may be, um, it's sort of a, you can actually do this and effectively you can choose which data set you want. Do you want Landsat 7, 8 or Sentinel 2? And if, you, if I was to scroll up, I, I would see Hyperion as well. And you can put in your date uh, range that you want it to go, go from and effectively your cloud cover. And you'll come up with some kind of screen like this and it will hopefully show you approximately what the, the band uh, that you're looking at, depending on which date you want to choose. The one I'm looking at at the moment was the 4th of January 2020. And effectively, it looked like it was a relatively cloudy day. Now, what I'm unsure about, and, and using this, and it's, so I'm still I'm sort of not sure, is whether the right-hand side or the left-hand side was for this 2020 0401. It's obvious that they were different days, so it's, it's um, sometimes difficult. So I'm never absolutely happy using the Glovis website, whether it's a slightly older website or a slightly newer website, I don't know. So, uh, and from this kind of website, if you were to log in, you would be able to download the data. I noticed that the down on the right-hand side, right at the bottom, the download button is actually grayed out, which means I haven't logged in with my ID to the Globus site. So this was the one I actually tend to use more because I like it much better that you can see what you're doing, is to use something called earthexplorer.usgs.gov. There is another one as well. There's one on Copernicus as well, and they're all accessing the same data, but they're presenting it in different ways. So, you know, which, whichever way you want to use it, I don't mind, but if you've not used it before, I would, I would actually recommend Earth Explorer uh, because you can then set your search criteria. You can set the limits of your area quite tightly. You can actually put in each of these points and you can say, well, I only want to know about you know, so the area around these islands. Um, so that you can set a, a set of dates and you can, you can set it with, within these, these tabs up here. 
And so you, you can do this and quite often you'll set the cloud cover. You don't want huge amounts of cloud cover, less than 10%. Now what it does, it gives you a base map here that actually um, shows you the, the, the best imagery that they think they've got. There's some sort of compilation of, uh, of sort of uh, try, try to put together the best. So you can really zoom in and you can say, well, have I got the right, the right area that I want to do? And I would always make sure that you, you know, tie it down quite uh, carefully to the, just the area that you want. Don't try and include too much more because the boxes that it'll give you will be 100 kilometers by 100 kilometers. But where the edges of those is not always um, given easily. And you may swap from one scene to another, you might be, and then you'll get uh, picked results uh, that it's picking. You'll get those results from, uh, from an area that you're not really quite interested in, and you'll have to sort of sort, sort through them. So if you do something like this and sort of ask for the results, it will give you a set of results down here. And this one gave me 384 results. I've theoretically got 384. I didn't give it a date, I don't think. Um, I just said, give me all you've got. And it's, it's, it's done, done like this. But each one, of, each one of these has this little toolbar. It's here. So you can get a footprint of the screen, so you can, of, the, of the scene, so you can see where about it, it is. You can ask to browse the metadata, so you can actually have a, have a quick look at what the, um, um, the actual scene looks like. And this one, for those islands that I was looking for, effectively, those islands are covered in cloud. Hopefully you can see that. So therefore, I wouldn't be going to download now. Sort of, I'd, I'd probably be looking for a, a different scene. But it does give you an idea of what the cloud cover is for, for what your uh, the quest, and also sort of when it was taken. So you can actually see that this one was taken on the 7th of February, 2021. Sort of uh, on, the, on the acquisition date there, sort of uh, as it passed over. Um, so you know, sort of you can start looking at that. But and what it gives me is going to give you a very quick look. And one of the quick looks that it has will look like this: this bottom one here. Sort of uh, at which point, uh, sort of uh, it will actually look like this on the quick browse. But actually, this is the data that you're going to download. So how do you download? You hit the download button. It will come up with two options. One will be um, effectively the whole tile plus all the different uh, bands. And the other one will be a quick look uh, browsing image, which again is this, this one right in the bottom, bottom right corner. That's what it will look like if you just click on that one. That one's only two megabytes, um, but the download for the big, the big L1C tile in the JPEG 200 uh, format is on this one is about 500 megabytes. Uh, they can be anything from 300. I think the biggest I've had is about 700 megabytes. So it does take a wee while to um, to download. So you, you download that, you save it, save it to a file. It has, actually does come as a zip file, um, and at which point you can then unzip it on your on, on your computer and off you go. So we've now got the data. So what are we going to do with it? Okay, so that's a, and how are we going to do a satellite derived bathymetry? Well, there's a, a very good paper by Stumpf and Holroyd uh, in 2017, I think. I forgot to put the date there. Um, and sort of uh, effectively, they found that the, the, if you took a simple ratio of the natural log of two optical wavelengths, it was proportional to depth. So effectively, we got this formula so the natural log of the reflectance of two optical uh, wavelengths was you know, just effectively a simple uh, scalar and an intercept. And you go, oh, right, okay, that makes life quite easy. So if you, can, if you have that, that ratio for lots and lots of different pixels, you can work out what those pixels are. And then if you know some depth points, I'm just saying some depth points, you know, sort of you've measured it here and there, or maybe it, something like that, you can then create a graph of lots of points of depth or known depth points against the band ratio for that point. And effectively, you'll hopefully get some kind of relatively straight line. And a regression will find you a, a value for your M1 and your M0. And then you can work out your degree of fit 
Now, how, how good are your points fitting to that one line? And that would be uh, ex expressed with an R squared value. Um, and the fits would be an R squared of point, 0.2 or less, means the fit's not particularly good. Uh, or if it's greater than about 0.8, it's ooh, pretty darn good. Now, generally, we use the blue and green bands. If it, uh, sample two only has one green and one blue, Hyperion data has probably about 20 uh, blue and green bands that are sort of uh, coming together there. And they say we, we can work with water depths up to about 20 meters. Okay, so that's that's the um, the physics behind it. Um, so what can we, how can we use that? Well, on Friday, if you were uh, part of session number four, I introduced a toolbar that is available for, for download at this web address that will actually start doing some of this for you. It sort of, it won't do the download for you. You have to do that off the internet itself. But this is a toolbar and a toolbox uh, that works within ArcMap, okay, which is licensed software, I'm afraid. Um, uh, and so therefore, hopefully your institutions may have a version of this, anything from a version of 10.1 to 10.8. Uh, you will require the spatial analyst um, extension as well. Um, and the whole thing about this is that all the techniques that are available in here are hopefully there and produce a result for you quite quickly and quite easily without you having to know too much about um, any of the, of the way that it's working. You get a result quite quickly. And once you get a result quite quickly, you can then tweak some of the parameters and say, well, maybe I'll, I will not use this or will I will use something else. And, and then you can start to get better and better results. Be warned, as, as I think James said at, in, in session four, uh, sort of always treat a map that you get at the end with a certain amount of skepticism and, and you know, because you want to know that your confidence, okay? But the toolbar, you don't need any programming knowledge, you know, sort of, uh, and it, what it, the toolbar does, it puts all, the, all those marine tools in one uh, location. Okay, so it, it does do all these steps for you. And you know, sort of something like one of these wizards would have 26 steps. If you imagine trying to do all 26 steps, one after the other, and then not making a mistake on any of them. If you make a mistake on one of them, you probably won't find out until you get to the end, at which point you'll go, ah, right, I better start again. You may not know where your mistake was. Um, sort of, uh, or you used a, a value that, that wasn't particularly uh, pertinent to, to the data. So yes, it's sort of, a, it'll do this. But what I want to really uh, plug this time is effectively there is one for satellite tools. And there are visas for satellite derived bathymetry. And on the satellite, there are effectively five tools. Now, in addition to those five tools for satellite derived bathymetry, there is an, another, a second toolbar, also for download, for free download. It's on the, on the website um, for the, um, for our for our website for these workshops, and again, so that you can download that one as well. It's sort of, uh, and I say it works for this, and it, and it has a simple installer to install this toolbar, and another uh, installer to install this one. So, sort of, uh, how do I get these? As I say these are download. You'll see this on the corner of, of the website. Um, click on the download of our, our, our toolbars, and you'll find two executables: one for seventy-five, which is the um, the marine tools and the 400 megabytes toolbar because it's got a lot of background uh, information in it and correction factors um, for the satellite tools. Okay, we need administrative privilege uh, to install them, but they can be used under standard user IDs uh, when using ArcMap. So again, sort of very quickly, we did this on, on Friday. Um, when you run, say, the marine tools setup, it will come like this. Satellite tools will look exactly the same. You have a nicer agreement, license agreement. You install it somewhere. Uh, so the suggestion would be either marine tools, it might be even down to satellite tools, or um, I think I, I sometimes call it NOC tools, which is sort of um, the National Oceanography Center tools. And it, you know, it'll install those, hopefully it will be okay, at which point it'll be successful and finish. So that's that's all fine. So yes, you can you can do that. If you are not having administrative privilege yourself. Um, you will then need to run this little install.bat for a standard user um, after installation, um, just so that it sets up everything for that user as well as 
which needs to be set up for the administrator. So sort of um, once we've got installation successful, um, sort of um, again, sort of here's the download for it. Sort of, uh, and just to say, when you download it, it will be a zip file. It needs to be unzipped. And there is a password for that, which is CME21. Okay, just very quickly. And this is what the website for the download will look like. Okay, so the first tool on the satellite thing is called Radiance to Reflection, Reflectance. And effectively, this does the atmospheric corrections that are required to go from the raw data you just downloaded um, to a reflection data that you can actually use and have uh, do uh, calculations with. Effectively, it's just removing that those atmospheric conditions um, that will that do affect it. And effectively, there's two ways of doing it. There's one that's radiance to reflection, where you define an area of deep water, effectively where there's no sea floor or features seen. So something that's going to be deeper than probably um, 25 uh, meters or more. Uh, sort of. Uh, so you 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 digitize a certain certain area. And effectively, you put that in this box. Here, here's the tool itself, very straightforward. And then we can then convert each of the bands for all the bands in here and hit OK. It'll, and it'll do the correction for you. What could be simpler than that, really? Well, what could be simpler is to use what's called the Acolyte. This is a, uh, a package that comes from a Belgian institution, uh, the RBINS um, in Belgium. Um, and they have produced this package called Acolyte. And again, it does a much more rigorous conversion um, using things, which is very easy to use, but it is a bit slow, um, sort of. And you just put in the whole data set, you just put in that whole file that came, that you downloaded, and it'll output those files and give you a new an output directory. In fact, when you run, when you put your input file into there, it'll actually give you a suggested output directory as well. But really, you put that in there, hit OK, and sort of, a, it is really that easy. 15 minutes, I have make a cup of tea, you see, that's grand. I like cups of tea, so that's grand. Um, right, so sort of um, once we've done our correction for atmospheric conditions, the next thing is I do is the NDVI, the Normalized Difference Vegetation Index. Uh, or sort of, um, and effectively, this is a very useful index for land, generally. And you go, yeah, it's got its use, use for vegetation and stuff like that. For marine things, not, not, no, we're not going to use it for that as such. But what it actually is very good at is demarking where there is land and where there is water. As you can see, I've got a, a, a simple uh, scene here uh, with a few clouds. And effectively, you can see that it's picked out the, the land pretty darn well. And sort of going, it's also picked out the clouds. And to create the normalized difference vegetation index, you just two, take two bands, band four and band three of, of Landsat or whatever uh, band that might be out of Sentinel, or 783 nanometers um, wavelength and 640 nanometers. And if you go to help, it'll actually tell you what, what bands those are. So there's sort of a, there, is, there is help available on, on this tool. And it'll give you uh, a, a, a result like this. So once you've got things like that, you can actually say, hey, look, I can actually make a threshold of that and say, right, okay, there is uh, what I would call land oh, and cloud. And you're going, oh, that's very quite nice. But I don't know if you notice that the clouds have a shadow on the, on the water's surface. There's another one here. There's a large cloud here and it has a shadow over there which has totally affected the way that the satellite has seen the water. The, the statistics of the imagery are going to be considerably different where that shadow is. So unfortunately, uh, A, we can't see underneath the cloud, but B, we can't see underneath the shadow either. Um, that's why it's always quite, quite good to make sure that we have got areas that have got no cloud at all. But you know, so what we can do is we can change the threshold for the NDVI if we were to change it to minus 0.133, great number, uh, sort of effectively, I, I looked at the previous, I looked at this previous one, and I just looked to see what, what where that color boundary was. And I said, well, the color boundary is, is, is down here in the, in the blues, maybe, or even, even down here. And so effectively, 
I just had a quick quick look and said, mm, okay, let's 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 have a look at that. And if we do that, if we use that as a threshold for cloud identification. I change that from 0.8 to minus 1.33. The values go from one to minus one. Uh, we got this, and you'll notice that it's picked out quite a bit more of the cloud here and here. And you're going, oh, okay, well, that's, that's good. It's going to mask out parts that uh, we can't use. It hasn't done an absolutely perfect job, I will admit, because the clouds down here and the shadow from them here has not been picked out yet. And maybe I need to reduce that even further, uh, make, it, make, make this not, not minus 0 0.2. But you can play with these things. So that's the whole point of the way that this works. You can you can play with play with it. So, I've, but anyway, let, let's let's say we're going to go ahead with this and um, and do and do this. Um, sort of, uh, we can look at the various um, the way that we use this. So we've got our cloud and land mask. What we're going to do is to add some bathymetry. So again, here's my satellite image. Now, for this area, I've never been to this area, unfortunately. Um, this was an area of uh, Cambodia, and I didn't have any depth data as such, and I didn't have any sort of point as a, a multi-beam or anything else like that. But what I did have, the only thing I had, was a chart, and the chart had depths on it. So what did I do? I digitized those, chart, uh, those points. Not the best way of doing things, I will admit, but if you've got, you know, sort of... Um, if that's all you've got, that's all you've got. Sort of, uh, so you can see all the numbers here, and then I just did a, uh, made a point and then typed in whatever depth I could read off the chart. So I've got one and 0.2. This one in the middle here is 2.3. So you can see I've done that. And I've just sort of only done half, half, half this so far, and I want to do, do a few more. And I'll probably do all of these as well, just to make sure that I've, I've got enough points. And in fact, this is a this is a um, a zoom in of the whole scene. And sort of, uh, I didn't have a, a chart for the whole scene, but I had a chart for the area that I thought that I was going to look at to see whether you know this chart here um, hasn't got any fine detail on it at all. But I'm hoping that each of these points is the things. So I chose 150 de depth points and dig digitized those. Hopefully, I might have had some multi beam echo sounder, at which point I could then. Um, take a random set of points from that and sort of um, put them into this little, this little thing, which is convert the symmetry grid into a random series of points. And I've asked for a thousand points from the bathymetry grid. Now the bathymetry grid um, from a multi-beam may have something like a million points. So it's not using a vast amount of that. But what it's allowing you to do is spread your knowledge uh, from the way you have got bathymetry data, and maybe just here and there, uh, sort of, to maybe the whole the, the bigger area and stuff like that. And again, you have to define what you consider good data. Is depth data negative or is depth data positive? Depends if you're a person who likes topography or bathymetry. Anyway, so there's sort of, um, so that we've covered radiance reflection, we've covered the uh, normalized difference vegetation index, cloud and identification, and we've got some bathymetry points. So we go on to the actual tool that does derive satellite derived bathymetry. And uh, so again, sort of, we have got our initial satellite image. So question is, we put in our satellite bands that we want. Do we want satellite bands one and two, which are uh, blue and green? Um, do we want satellite bands one, two, and three, say from Landsat? Or do we want central bands one, two, to one, two three, and four? Um, sort of, and sort of, you've got a choice. You can put in those that you want to, and those you don't. It's going to need to know how to, to change those um, logarithmic ratios of one band to another, the stump uh, calculation, um, to make into, into pr predict where things are. So you're going to put in your known bathymetry points, which will be some kind of shape file, um, your shape point file. And it'll have a, it'll have a certain field name, so you have to you have to put the field name in there. It'll have it'll be a pull down menu, and you'll be able to see what it is. Hopefully, your field name will be depth or uh, water, or so it'll it'll have some kind of name. That. You can then put in your 
cloud and land masks, they may be the same, they may be different. So sort of, we can put in any number of cloud and land masks. So we started start to put all the, all the things that you need to do derived bathymetry, which we have done with the previous steps. And then sort of, um, it's gonna ask you for three output files. Now it produced some output default names, make life easy for you. Um, so that, that, that's all quite nice. And then the question will be, do you want to just do a two band, you know, sort of band one against band two, but if you put in three bands, you could do one against two, one against three, or two against three. You've got a choice. Or you could ask it to do multiple regression, one against two plus, one against three plus, three against, two against three. Yeah. And then sort of, uh, if you have four bands, there's even more options, which I'll show you in a second. And then finally, um, you know, how many of those depth values do you actually want to use to make the model? Now you can use all of them, 100% of them, uh, just to make the model. And you're going, well, maybe I'll pull some back and hold some back to test the model. Again, this is something we, we, we talked about on Friday, or James talked about on Friday, um, that we're gonna hold some back. So we could put, say, 70% there, but we'll use 70% of the points, and then we use 30% to test the to test the model to see if it's any good. Um, so we'll, we'll see what happens. And once you do that, you hit OK and go and have a cup of tea. It'd come back in about two or three minutes. I've forgotten how long, but well, it depends how, how big your data set is. If it's one big great scene of bathymetry, I think it was taking six minutes. That's 100 kilometers by 100 kilometers. But it does depend on how many points, bathymetry points you put in and how many bands you put in as well. But on my computer um, that I've got here, uh, which is a laptop, it was taking six minutes to run. So nine, enough time to boil the kettle, pour yourself a cup of tea and come, come sit down and see whether it's finished. So just to go through you know, what that looks like on this data, on, this, on this, little, this little data set that I've got here, just to give you some examples. So we download the data. The download initially looks like that. We then do the radius reflection and the conversion and we suddenly get this. And hopefully you can see there's a mass, massive difference in the, the resolution and the way that you're look, looking at it. This is just a, a relatively small TIFF file, whereas this is a full, full resolution, 10 meter resolution for satellite. This is Sentinel-2 data, um, putting, putting that together. So then we go from that um, radius reflection data, the corrected data to a normalized different vegetation index. We then have to find maybe where that uh, threshold is. So we, we do that and that then use that to calculate the cloud and land uh, to do that. And here, yeah, these are the polygons just the same to mask off the land and the clouds. We then define some bathymetry points. Uh, so we take, take all these things and sort of all these points here Hopefully you, you might have better data than I have got for this, uh, for this area. We're doing this, I was doing this spe speculatively to, 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 to see what I could do. And finally, sort of, um, I run satellite drive bathymetry um, command and it produced this. And I'm going, oh, okay, this is not, it's not too bad. I, I feel reason, reasonably happy with that. Uh, you'll notice that the area that was actually cloud shadow has actually turned up in this, I didn't change the, um, the cloud identification, didn't, didn't change the uh, normalized di difference index. So I've actually got errors here. So I must know to um, take those out and sort of uh, and just say, I can't do anything. That's under the white areas, again, I can't do anything about it, unfortunately. That is um, sort of, uh, there is no, there's gonna be no data underneath there because there's, there's cloud in the way. Maybe we'll have to go to another scene uh, where that area isn't covered by cloud and do the same again, and then try and merge the two together. And I have then to just run one of the other tools within the toolbars, which is the contours, just to, just to have a look to see you know, what the contours look like. And these are half meter contours going from the coast, going down. So again, we are very shallow. We're, we're probably talking about three meters or something like that. It's really, really, really not sort of like that. But just this is just a very zoomed in part of a whole scene, which is 100 kilometers by 100 kilometers. So sort of, uh, but if I showed you the whole thing, well, sort of, uh, our screens aren't big enough for that. 
Now, just to give you a, a second example, here's one from the Belize shelf. Um, so sort of, uh, we were fortunate enough to have some really, really good data. I will say this data was, uh, we collected some photographic data uh, from a plane at the same time as doing some bathymetric LIDAR. So what we wanted to do here was to see how good uh, the data was coming off the LIDAR compared with the satellite imagery. So sort of, um, here's the, um, the imagery that you can see that, so it's akin to the satellite. Let's have a look at the satellite as well. And effectively, the satellite image actually is showing quite a lot of similar things. Now, I think possibly the ortho mosaic has got a lot higher resolution that you're not actually seeing here because the screen that you, that you and I are looking at needs to zoom in a lot further and you'll probably be able to see a, a lot more. But depending on what you want um, from your model, you know, is, is 10 meter resolution going to be enough? The ortho, this uh, ortho mosaic and the LIDAR did cost a heck of a lot of money. I don't know the exact cost, but I'm quite sure it was in the six figures of, uh, of US dollars, say, and so I'm going, ouch, that was expensive. You know, is the, res was, you know, is the result good? The bathymetric LIDAR may have IHO quality bathymetry. I don't know. You know sort of, uh, you know. So once we've, once we've got that, we've done our land and, I and cloud and land identification. You can again see that there's a, there's a bit of cloud here which has been found, the shadow has not. Again, sort of I've not turned the, uh, uh, that threshold up enough. And this, this, this is, you know, again saying, you must try these things, get a result and say, can I do better? And the answer is, yes, you can. It takes a little bit, little bit of extra work, but yes, that's fine. So um, sort of here we, we've got the satellite. If we then look at the LIDAR bathymetry, and again, the LIDAR bathymetry, I think it was actually done at better than four meter resolution. They just said it was huge um, and we had difficulty handling, or I had difficulty handling that. So sort of, um, and I just want to say there's, what, to get the, those bathymetry points to actually match the points to, uh, the, to the, the ratio of bands that we're, that we're looking at, I just took a thousand uh, data points randomly over the area and said, right, okay, I'm going to take those thousand points and then sort of use those points to train the satellite derived bathymetry. So what did it produce? It produced a bathymetry map here, which we're showing quite nicely. And so you know, if we can compare that against the actual satellite composite image that we've got, the, the corrected image, and you can see that there is a nice channel down here, which was seen in the, in the imagery but now it has actually got a depth value and it's going from shallower, you can just see it's, it's browner here, and it's going yellower, meaning it's getting slightly deeper. It's also actually given some depth to these little points here, which I presume are little coral knolls. Um, so looking, looking very nice. And you're going, oh, okay, that's really nice. So, you know, we got a result. Thing to do now is to check the statistics on it. Um, so sort of, um, we can look at the band ratios against depth, and we can see the band ratio of band one against band two gave us a not particularly wonderful um, uh, regression there, r squared of 0.138, not particularly good. Band one against band three, so we're looking at the sort of the more violet against the green, and going, well, it's getting, that's getting not too bad, it's sort of a 0.368, not, not, not wonderful, it's sort of, a, and then sort of we look at all the different band combinations, one against four, two against three, two against four, three against four. Three against four is pretty awful. So that's, you know, that's definitely getting into the um, higher wavelengths, which get absorbed quite quickly. We're getting into the, the, into the red, and red does not travel through water very well. So we're looking at something pretty nice. But if we do a multiple regression of all four bands, we get an R squared of 0.729. Now we do have to be careful that we're not over predicting um, exactly the, the, this result. But I'm an optimist, I'm going, nah, it's fine. Um, and sort of maybe I shouldn't be, um, but I, that's where I am. Um, obviously it says I took 500 random points, I've forgotten that. Right, and we use 75 to do the model, and then we use 25% to test. 
So we, uh, what I then did is I looked at the error of all the, the points I use, and I saw that, that you know, it predicted on those points I use actually it ended up at 0.87 meters on those use points. But on the test points, it was about 0.66 of a meter error. Okay, so it's giving a depth within 66 centimeters. And you go, well, maybe, maybe that's good enough. Maybe it isn't, but we have to uh, just have a look at this. So I then thought, well, okay, if I remove some of the bands and sort of try it again, instead of using bands one, two, three, and four, let's just use two, three, and four. And I got a, a, a sort of a, a, a slightly different, a slightly worse R squared. Um, and the error, okay, increased slightly. If I tried another one, just using bands two and three, again, it dropped a little bit and the error just changed a little bit as well. So sort of, um, it's, look, you're looking at sort of um, how, how things change and you're sort of getting an idea of how good and how um, happy you are with the result. And finally, you know, sort of, this was the, the derived bathymetry that we got from the satellite data. We then compare that against the actual, uh, or the better actual LIDAR bathymetry. You can actually see that it's doing, I think, quite a reasonable job. It's finding most of the features that I would probably want to find. Um, maybe, you know, the, the, the color, color scales aren't the same, unfortunately, on, on, these, two, on these two images. Um, but it's finding all, all the features and giving them um, you know, similar types of depths and stuff like that. So, you know, so I'm looking quite good. I will say the LIDAR does have a certain amount of stripiness. I don't know if you can see the stripiness going up in this, this direction, sort of uh, northeast, southwest, which is the direction of the plane that collected this data going up in there. So there is a certain amount of artifact within this LIDAR bathymetry, um, which is a shame. Uh, sort of, uh, so it, it means that you know, the LIDAR Bathymetry isn't perfect, it's pretty, pretty good and stuff like that. So that's uh, sort of created from effectively a toolbar where you just throw your data at it, do a few minor things like uh, your cloud identification and your land identification, give it some depths and say go. And sort of a, and really sort of it makes it rather simple to use. Maybe the results are not uh, relatively simple as well, but I do think it is very simple to use and it's happening all on your own desktop. You don't need to worry too much about um, what's going on there. Okay, so we are going to have a little break now for maybe 10 minutes, um, but I'm willing to take some questions now.